Welcome to The Found Records. I'm your host, Jessica Ville, and this is episode three of The Found Records. The Found Records is dedicated to correcting history, um, especially history that has been so widely believed to be true, but actually is wildly incorrect. So for episode one, we touched on Marilyn Monroe's legacy and corrected all the wrongs. Episode two is centered around Betty Boop and the recent conspiracy that ended up being wrong and explaining the real history of Betty Boop. And now we're on to episode three, which will be centered around all of Michael Jackson, um, ranging from the ac- accusations as well as things like his, you know, skin conditions and, you know, all these other lies about him. So this is just a Michael Jackson episode all the way around, debunking it all. I would like to start off with a disclaimer that there are some triggers that are that will be discussed in this episode. So if you have a history of abuse, this might be a harder topic for you to tune into. The second disclaimer I'd like to give is that I highly recommend you actually listen to the podcast um, from the beginning to the end. And I encourage it because I'm not coming onto this podcast episode with opinions. I'm coming onto this podcast episode with actual evidence. Um, I've got tapped phone calls. I've got, uh, interviews. I've got FBI files. Um, these are indisputable. They cannot be argued. Um, and because of that, I really recommend educating yourself through this podcast and then forming your opinion on the matter. I feel like a lot of people will jump into nasty accusations like how could you be a you know a defender of the like, just listen and you will you will answer your own question. I feel like every time I have ever made content centered around Michael Jackson people jump before they listen. And uh it's coming from a place of emotion and though I understand um it is hard to believe that the truth could be anything but you would be surprised how much darker the story really truly is um and you should be appalled that, that this has gotten to the scale that it did this should disgust you so um i also want to lead with another disclaimer is that yes i i am known to be a michael jackson fan no that does not make me biased in fact when i began learning about the case, I was deciding whether to continue to be a fan. I did not want to support an artist um, who has history of pedophilia, obviously. And so I went down the rabbit hole to see, because the case was always just so blurry and, you know, there was a lot of uh, rumor centered around it, I wanted to get down to the truth and then decide, am I going to continue supporting Michael Jackson or not? From my findings, and I've gone pretty deep, I mean, I've gotten so deep that I'm honored now to say that I'm even a family friend of the Jacksons, and I'm a huge supporter of the docu- or the uh, biopic that they're coming out with very soon, um, but I got the honor to meet Taj Jackson, um, I got the honor to go to a Janet Jackson concert, um, I got to meet Tatiana Thompson, which was in the Way You Make Me Feel music video, uh, Michael Jackson's nurse, Michael Jack- one of Michael Jackson's best friends, so I've... Uh, centered myself around Michael Jackson's circle to learn more intimately about his life and who he was as a person. So even though what I'm going to be showing you is evidence of a time I wasn't alive, I have still been able to have the honor to center myself around the people who were alive at that time and can speak for him. On top of that, I am coming in throughout this podcast showing my sources Um, which are only raw and organic sources is going to be tabloid free. Um, So when I am making this podcast and when I'm speaking through this podcast, I am speaking accurately as my found records podcast is dedicated to doing. Um, And I do encourage those to try to rebuttal um, any of the claims I have mentioned throughout this episode. Um, But if you're going to rebuttal it, please do so with raw and equally um, respected sources and not tabloid junk or uh, conspiracy theory articles. Like, don't waste either of our times. (laughs) So um, I think those are all the things I wanted to say before we got started. And those are things I just feel like I had to get out of the way respectfully. Um, I don't mean to sound like maybe condescending or like I'm a know-it-all, but I have dedicated over a decade worth of my time just learning more and more about everything, the people around him and who he was. And I feel 110% confident that everything in this episode will be 100% accurate. 
Um, and it can only be 100% accurate because I have evidence of everything I will claim. So um, a lot of this episode will also be referencing Square One, the Michael Jackson documentary. I highly recommend checking that out. Um, the director did an incredible job. And in fact, that's a lot of where my sources will be coming from because he kind of did the dirty work with Square One. Um, I have always had shreds of evidence on random computers for like the past 13 years, but trying to find where all of those files are is going to take forever. Um, so I was very excited to realize that um, the director of Square One included all the sources in his documentary, um, which allowed me to rip them from him and put it into this podcast episode. Um, but I will not only just cover what the documentary covers. I'm also going to be adding a little bit of extra context of who Michael Jackson was and his psychology and why everything happened the way it did. Um, I do have a little bit more of a wider picture of everything because I was able to talk to people in his life that were close to him. So um, if, you know, if you have friends or family members who still believe Michael Jackson is guilty, send them this podcast episode and let's get educated together. So let's get started. <clears throat> so I just want to go ahead and, sh and direct you to a raw source here. If you go to um, vault.fbi.gov, they do have the Michael Jackson case on file. Um, every single page is on there. And if you specifically go to page uh, 17 through 21, that is where you're going to see a lot of uh, what the FBI found, or in this case, did not find. Those pages, in fact, turned up negative. So it, they marked it as strong searches, nothing. Um, and they also have pay, or is it string searches or strong searches? String searches, nothing. They also scrubbed his uh, computers and on those uh, uh on the PDF, on those pages, it'll also turn up to be negative for child porn, which is, you know, almost guaranteed with every pedophilia case. It always starts off with possessing possession of child pornography, and he had nothing. You look at um, the synopsis for the case, it was um, to administratively close case. Um, so it was uh, requested, the writer requested the captioned investigation be closed there are no outstanding leads or evidence items. So nothing turned up for Michael Jackson and they have done this search for a long time. And the LAPD did come out and put out a statement saying that they have in fact still found nothing to this day. So how did these allegations begin and where did they come from? Well, let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you, it is messy. So this started in 1993 to 1994 with Evan Sharmatz, which was later, he changed his name to Evan Chandler, and he is the face of the allegations. Evan Chandler um, was a dentist, and he had this lifelong passion to be a screenwriter and movie producer. So he changed his name from Evan Sharmatz to Evan Chandler um, because it sounded more Hollywood-esque and less Jewish. Um... And so his dream was to quit dentistry and make money in the Hollywood industry. How um, Michael Jackson and Evan Chandler met? Well, they met through the owner of, I think it was called rent a -Rec, or rent a, rent -a -Rec. It was a storage unit facility owned by Dave Schwartz. And he uh, knew June, which was Evan Chandler's wife. They were friends. And Dave knew Michael Jackson. So... Dave learned that June's son, Jordan Chandler, was a fan of Michael Jackson. And I'm talking diehard fan, wore the fedora and everything. And he's like, well, you know, let's connect you two. So um, Dave connected June to Michael Jackson. And Michael Jackson here, there is a screenshot I, I have saved here. It says right here, the interaction between June and Michael Jackson it was almost like she was forcing the boy on him, Green recalls. I think Michael thought he owed the boy something, and that's when it all started. Um, so June was like, you know, Michael, we're such a fan. Like, my, my son's such a fan of you. And Michael um, then was like, hey, well, I have, I have Neverland. Maybe come over and one of these times, like, go and ride the amusement park that he had. The amusement park was built... 
um, oh, I'm trying so hard to, the, to make this as organized as possible. The amusement park was built from basically trauma. So to give you a little bit of backstory before we continue on to the allegation route, um, Michael Jackson grew up very abused. At the age of eight, he was getting belted around, um, yelled at. Um, he was not sexually abused. He was physically beaten by his father, Joe. And it was just like me dying. And you just flipped all over your face, your back, everywhere. And I always hear my mother back, no, Joe, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill him. No. You know, like, I was like, I was, I would just give up. Like, there was nothing I could do, you know. And I, and I hated him for it. Hated him. And you look in the audience and he'd make a face like this. You go, oh, I can't mess up. He's going to kill us. It would just scare the bejesus out of you. And he'd be like, everybody's talking you like, like looking at you hard, like, don't you mess up, you know, and I'm like, oh, God, I'm in trouble after the show. We hear his car coming down the drive. We drove, always drove this big Mercedes, and he drives real slow. Shut up, home, shut up, home, quick, boom, door stop. Everybody runs to their room. Like, there's some time I'd be in bed at night sleeping. It's 12 at night. The door's locked. So I'm giving you five seconds. You know, open, I'm going to kick it down. And he starts kicking it. Boom, kick it, like breaking the door down. Why are you signing that contract today? I go, I don't know. He goes, well, sign it. If you don't sign it, you're in trouble. So you would sign? I had to. He was, he was very physical. He'd throw you and hit you as hard as he can. And I'll never forget this. Janet and myself, we say, I would say, Janet, shut your eyes. She'd go, okay, that's shut. I said, picture Joseph in a coffin. He's dead. Did you feel sorry? She would go, no. That's what we would do to each other as kids. <laughs> We'd like play games like that. Um, and he wasn't allowed to go on playgrounds. He wasn't allowed to have any sense of childhood, but to practice and perform. Um, and with that, he got to miss out on very normal kid-like things. This obviously, as it would in anyone, create a sense of trauma. And that trauma can be expressed later in adulthood through childlike activities and things called age regression. I don't know if you've ever heard of age regression trauma, but that is, um, a state of mind that occurs in victims who have uh, this desire to recreate their childhood, to live out their childhood they didn't get to have as a kid. Um, and age regression is noted scientifically to be non-sexual, and it has been noted in women at the time, but it actually wasn't studied in men at the time. So age regression wasn't even something talked about, and to this day, it is very... Um, much not discussed um, in most spaces. But a victim of uh, trauma often develops age regression, and in that process, that is where the human mind at times gets triggered to regress back to the age of abuse and try to correct the wrongs. So they might um, do things like coloring books or go to uh, playgrounds or dress up as a child it can get pretty severe to the point of where they need a caretaker so that way when they do regress in age mentally there is an adult in the equation to make sure that they don't do anything foolish during that phase and sometimes it can get a it can get pretty disorienting to age regress because it's involuntary at times those are more extreme cases so michael jackson and this is something that his nurse agreed with me on is that it looks like he had signs of age regression. Um, and again, age regression is scientifically noted as a non-sexual behavior, um, which is not what pedophiles experience. It says right here that Michael Borak, a forensic psychiatrist at the University of Cincinnati Medical School, has evaluated many pedophiles and says Jackson does not fit the usual profile. His eccentric behavior is not typical of most offenders, Borak said. Most offenders are normal people who could be your neighbors, they're not freaky or weird. Most pedophiles will keep toys or other such appealing items around to lure children, but they do not usually play with the items much themselves, like Michael Jackson did. Michael Jackson was an avid vintage collector. He collected many toys. He often played with the toys he collected, and it was all to get everything that he wanted when he was eight years old and couldn't have at that time. That is not a usual profile for a pedophile. So, <clears throat> he built Neverland for that reason, um, and that was his way of coping with the trauma. On top of that, he had this strong sense of justice. This is a character uh, trait in Michael Jackson 
that a lot of his family members all can agree on is that he had this strong sense of justice in general. And you see that even with his music, like the song, They Don't Care About Us. Um, the fact that he has raised money for multiple charities, was an advocate for um, ending police brutality. He has shown time and time again that he has a strong sense of justice and almost like a superhero or Superman complex. Um, so those are some traits that really play into um, why Michael Jackson was the perfect, the perfect person to frame. So let's go back to when uh, Michael Jackson met June and Jordan Chandler. So at this time in Jordan Chandler's life, which is the child, um, Evan Chandler, his father, was not in his life. Um, he was just a deadbeat and he owed $70,000 in child support. Um, so that gives you an idea of just how much of a deadbeat he really was. Um, and so Michael was sort of filling in this father figure role. Another trait you should know about Michael Jackson that his family has mentioned to me is that he was, Michael Jackson's the kind of person that had trouble saying no. He could say no, but he doesn't use the word no, you know, um, he kind of is avoidant of confrontation. And so if you told him, Hey, Michael, I like your TV. Can I have it? He would probably say yes. And there actually is a story of that with, I believe, was it Chris Tucker? You like something like I was just complimenting a, a flat screen TV he had and he gave it to me. I was like, Michael, you, I didn't want the TV. <laughs> but then the black came out of me. I started liking everything after that. I was like, I was like, I was like, I said, Michael, I like that Rolls Royce. That's a bad Rolls Royce. Not the old one, the new Rolls Royce right there. He's a very giving person, but on top of that, he's also just a pushover. Um, so if... Jordan Chandler wants to come to Neverland eight times in a row, Michael just says, okay. Um, with that being said, he was coming over often and Michael would, would do this not only for Jordan Chandler, but for multiple kids ranging from, um, sick kids to just, uh, low income kids. Those were really his focus, but he did hang out with, you know, celebrity kids as well. Um, but basically his, uh, house was a mini Disneyland and it was for charitable purposes more often than not. And so he wanted to give children, um, the childhood that they can't afford. So he would call, he would do this thing called the Royal treatment. And it's where all of the maids at, uh, Neverland, they would, you know, give them candy and take, give them a tour and throw like wa uh, water balloon parties and just make it seem fun and carnival like and dreamlike. And, um, you know, that comes from just the fact that he missed out on his childhood. He wanted to give it to people so they didn't miss out on their childhood. That was the dynamic at Neverland and multiple sources can back that up. So this is uh, from November 25th, 1992. Uh, this was the Make-A-Wish Foundation specifically for David Sonnet. Um, David Sonnet uh, was someone who dreamed of meeting Michael Jackson and he was being invited to go along with other children from the Make-A-Wish Foundation to Neverland Ranch. David suffered a brain aneurysm at the age of eight, leaving him only able to function through a communication device a specialized computer which helps him convey his thoughts. Before this encounter, David had written to Michael Jackson on numerous occasions, and Michael would write back and include photos and other personal mementos, including one of his fedora hats. According to David's mother, Michael Jackson's music helped uh, her son recover from a coma, and his recovery room being decorated with numerous Michael Jackson photos, and his music played all the time. So Michael at this time started feeling very taken advantage of, um, obviously the Chandlers are coming across a little leechy. Um, they're constantly asking for things from him, money, cars, um, a, a whole house on his property. Um, mostly money though, like here and there, like, Oh, I need my bills are due. Can you pay my bills? Um, they've asked for all sorts of objects and things from him. And at the beginning he gave them, but the more and more they kept asking, the, the more he started kind of pushing back and avoiding them, avoiding their phone calls, 
Um, he had confrontational issues. They were very, very bad. Him saying no is like one of the most rarest things in the world. And um, it's simply, again, that is linked from trauma because his father, um, you know, he wasn't allowed to say, no, I don't want to practice right now. He would get beaten into doing it. So no was a hard word for Michael. Um, and many times he was caught hiding in his own house whenever the Chandlers would come over unannounced and would tell his maids, um, and his maids have said this on camera, that um, Michael would hide and say, just tell them I'm not home. Like, just tell them I'm not home. And they kept saying, like, how long are you going to hide from them? And this pissed off um, Evan Chandler. And I will read a transcript here from a phone call. Uh, where is that page? Here you go. <clears throat> Chandler says, I respected him and everything else for what he is. You know, there was no reason why he had to stop calling me. He could have called me. So just overall, there is this sense of like, he, he feels rejected by Michael Jackson. On top of that, he feels like Michael Jackson is um, trying to break his family apart. There's that sense of jealousy. June loves hanging with Michael Jackson. Chan or Jordan Chandler loves hanging with Michael Jackson, but neither of them want to hang out with Evan. And so like, there's this really toxic relationship of just like uh, leech slash jealousy that it was just a toxic disaster. And Latoya Jackson actually once came over and talked to Michael Jackson and said, hey, you need to stay away from people who are constantly you asking you for favors and stuff. Like you need to, you know, back off a bit. And the fact that Latoya could see that from the outside says a lot about this relationship here. Um, it says right here in another transcript, let me put it to you this way, Dave. Nobody in this world was allowed to come between this family of June, me, and Jordy. That was the hard blank, be the opposite. That's evil. That's one reason why he's evil. I spoke to him about it, Dave. I even told him that tape irregularity, the family. So he has outright admitted this and i'm gonna play for you guys a taped phone conversation from july 8th 1993 before the allegations were ever even filed were ever even spoken about this is a conversation that he had um when evan started picking up on the fact that michael jackson had no interest in furthering the friendship and uh was avoiding him so he started getting really pissed off. And this is the phone call he had. Be humiliated beyond belief. He will not believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen to him. Beyond, beyond his worst nightmares, sell one more record. If I go through with this, I win big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. He's talking about how he's furious that Michael has stopped phoning him and stop taking his calls and how Michael has stolen his ex-wife and torn the family apart and how he's plotting his revenge and he says everything is moving in accordance with a plan that's not just mine. And this telephone conversation occurred before Jordan Chandler made any allegations against Michael Jackson. And in this phone call, Evan Chandler alludes to a nasty attorney. This attorney I found, I mean, I interviewed several, and I picked the nastiest son of a bitch I can find. Once I make that phone call, this guy is just going to destroy everybody in sight. Any devious, nasty, cruel way that he can do it. And I've given him full authority to do that. It'll be a, a massacre if I don't get what I want. And the attorney he has hired is Barry Rothman. So Barry Rothman is is infamous for literally just doing the nasty, like illegal stuff, like borderline illegal stuff, um, doing whatever it takes to win, whatever it takes. This was his reputation. Now, um, this phone call doesn't show what the plan was. The plan wasn't created yet. What they were going to do to him, they weren't sure, but he wanted to get revenge. Um, I do want to note that Evan Chandler um, did try to ask Michael Jackson for money before he decided to, to um, drop those allegations on him. Um, he instead goes directly to Michael Jackson and his legal team and starts demanding $20 million. Trying to get the money so he can make a movie. His lawyer gets in touch with Michael Jackson's camp and says, 
$20 million and nobody will ever hear about these allegations. And Michael Jackson is adamant that he is not going to give Evan Chandler $20 million. So the counter offer, which comes back, a deal for three scripts. Mm -hmm. And they say, you'll be paid $350,000 per script. He said, I'll contribute that to your film project just to give you and your son a chance to to mend. Because at that time, Evan was saying, he's stolen my son's affection. He put that in the paperwork. He said, he's, my son is being starstruck by this superstar. He's stolen my son's affection. And so Michael just simply said, This will be a great opportunity for you and Jordy to reconnect because you'll be able to write them together. Rothman come back and say, you're nowhere near what we're asking for. That's less than $2 million. You know, we're, we're not going for that. The next offer that comes in from Jackson's camp is one single payment of $350,000. This amount shocked Barry Rothman because it was even lower than their first offer. So by now, Chandler and Rothman figured out that Jackson Camp was not serious about negotiating. So Evan Chandler suggests that he is willing to take the original $1 million deal. Pelicano responds, that's never going to happen. Meanwhile, the custody situation happens between Evan and June. But what happened was June filed an ex-party motion. An ex-party motion means show up in court the next day she was trying to get him back now and so we typed a little declaration and they went to court they went to court on the ex-party but see he had been negotiating with michael for a whole month for the 20 million dollars to make the movie he goes to court on a hearing for the custody a family law judge he said nothing to that judge about his suspicion or my child is, I think my child is, you know, being molested. He didn't say anything. So the judge ordered him to return Jordy back instantly. And in order to maintain custody, Evan has to go to the psychiatrist and have Jordy disclose. I can promise you three days later is when we got the breaking news. So he never took him back. He took him to the doctor that he had already queried about molestation. He sort of acts out of haste and goes and triggers the criminal proceedings as a knee-jerk reaction to the custody situation. So I wanted you to hear that because that's straight out of the original source's mouth. Um, She was in the law firm. She filed the paperwork like she was there. Um, And so just to recap, essentially Evan Chandler uh, had more interest in his movie endeavors um, than anything else before. The feelings he had with Michael getting more attention and love from both his son and wife, or I think they were divorced by then. I'm not exactly sure um, because if there's a custody battle, they mustn't have been together. Um, But you could see that, yes, that he had these feelings of like rage and jealousy, but those feelings fueled Evan to want to take advantage of Michael and not feel sorry for doing so because screw him, you know what I mean? But his number one priority was not ever at any point his son. The number one priority was his movies. And so that's why before he even went to the police or any some sort of, you know, normal thing that a parent would do uh, when they dis- discover these claims, um, he went straight to Michael and asked for $20 million dollars. And he has stated specifically it was for his movies. And the threat was blackmail. I won't file this this case if you give me $20 million for my movies. Michael says, absolutely not. I'll give you, you, I mean, I'll give you some money. Just leave me alone. Um, You could rekindle your relationship with your son and all will be well. Everyone's happy and everyone can move on. But Evan Chandler, you know, being as thirsty as he is, an opportunist, um he wanted more. Um, and then of course, because the court was demanding him to return his son, he acted hastily and to keep him, he had to prove that the son was not safe with mom. And so the way he did that was go ahead and just impulsively file the case against Michael Jackson. So that's how we got into that hole to begin with. Lots of bizarre feelings and bad decisions, selfishness, greed, it's a big hot mess. And this is what happens when you deal with people who are um, a little bit more on the unstable end. Um, and, th- and also 
there is this huge um, jump between incomes. I mean, you as a celebrity, you do position yourself in a in a spot of danger um, when you are hanging around people who are significantly uh, less well off than you, because jealousy does become a very very prominent factor of that relationship more often than not. And if the person is unstable, it's almost guaranteed that that's the case. Anyways, let's move forward. So immediately upon the allegations being filed, um, they went ahead and interviewed Jordan Chandler. I'm going to go ahead and pull out my source video for this um, because you can hear it from the investigators themselves. Evan had already retained a lawyer. Jordy Chandler was insisting that Michael had never touched him. Anthony Pelicano, who was Michael's private investigator, Pelicano goes round to in- interview Jordy Chandler and questions him for about an hour, I believe, and asks him all sorts of pointed and very direct questions. Have you ever seen Michael Jackson naked? Have you ever been naked in bed with Michael Jackson? Has he ever touched you, etc., etc.? And Geordie Chandler says no to everything. At the end of the conversation, Geordie Chandler reiterates that Michael's never done anything wrong to him and says that his dad is just trying to get money. Now, these allegations immediately hit uh, headlines. Unfortunately, during this time, tabloids were very, very unregulated. Um, and there are no fact checkers in the 90s, unfortunately. And this is evidence that reporters were paid to put out whatever it is, true or not. This is your evidence right here. Fly stories. We will take a shred of fact and go with it. Like a great footballer with a ball we will spin down the field with that and try and score a goal with it and maybe we will maybe we won't but we'll take a shred of evidence and try and turn it into a story that is in that is a journalist named leslie ann jones and she was a freelance reporter of the time um here uh, at this point when they were working on the case by the way um they started offering uh, other kids that knew Michael Jackson, uh, their families, offering them an opportunity to come forward for, I believe, up to $200,000, and here's evidence of that. Uh, so, naturally, acquired that he knew some family that knew the Jacksons, and they called me on the phone and asked me to come to the hotel. I said, I'm here to help Michael. Oh, he said, oh, no. We don't, that ain't what we want with you. We heard it that, that your boy's been nice at the house. We want to know if Michael tampered with him. I uh, just picked him up or touched him in any kind of way. If he did, we got 200000 for you. I said, huh? He said, you show him. What, what I'm going to do? I'm going to draw a check up, a contract up, and I'm going to show you we're going to get you 200000 So then you go to Germany, you get another 20000 You go to Italy, another 20000 Before you know it, you're up $100,000, $200,000, and that is enough for a family to uh, come forward and talk. It happened repeatedly where people of dubious character were treated as credible sources when anybody with just a, an iota of investigative savvy would know that these are not people that you want to be staking your reputation on. Uh, they were people that changed their story depending on how much money you offered them. The first time I heard the story about uh, Jackson, his hand was outside the kid's pants. They were asking a hundred grand as soon as their price went up to 500 grand, the hand went inside the pants. So, come on. So, um, the first person speaking was Ron Newt, which was Jackson family friend. The second one was Kevin Smith, who was a Splash News reporter. Um, Paul Barisi was a tabloid broker. These are all people that were centered around not only Michael Jackson, but the tabloids, and they have all said that they they they're all stories all lined up that they said that people were getting offered money to essentially invent stories and encounters so that way the Chandler story makes more sense. I'm going to quickly include a interview of Aaron Carter where he goes into detail of when he was approached to make an allegation for money. Then I get I get no limousine I leave. I get back to the Sheraton Hotel Universal over here. There's four FBI agents waiting for me in the hotel room. And my mom's there and she's like, tell them what happened. And I'm like, what do you mean tell them what happened? And I sit down with them and they all get asked these super sexually exploiting, you know, questions. 
back backsided questions. And I knew that at my age already. And I looked at all four of them and I said, I said, are y'all crazy? I said, what you think I'm going to do? Tell you that Michael did something bad so that we, we can sue him for money? That's what I told him. I was like, you're crazy. And I looked over at my mom and I was like, are you serious, mom? I was like, what is going on here? Why are you letting this happen? And she goes, she goes, well, she goes, oh, I think something happened. You know, I think something. I'm like, really? That man did nothing but be hospitable, kind, loving, giving, everything you can think of. We rode four wheelers for five hours, me, him, and Chris Tucker in the mountains at nighttime after his birthday party. Him and I hung out and talked pretty much all night. Got a couple hours of sleep. I wake up. But he's not even in the room. I, he pulled out a cop for me in his room because I asked him, I was like, I want to hang out with you. Want, you know, I want to be around. You know, it's Michael. Yeah. You know, I want to hang out with Michael. I want to hang out with Michael. He pulled out a, a little cot or something. I laid on the cot. I wake up in the morning. His bed's made. There's a cleaning lady that wakes me up. I keep asking, where's Michael? I go over. He's got this this huge statue figurine that Michael Jordan sent him for his birthday. I was like, nothing. And I looked at him right now. I said, nothing happened. Mm. I said, Michael was flirting with girls right in front of me. Actually. Yeah. And it was hilarious because he was very charming. <laughs> I bet. It's Michael Jackson. <laughs> he, made, he made girls just light up blush and he was he 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 and he, like i saw him looking at girl's booty i said i, I saw you looking at her booty he was like mm. i was like <laughs> and so i hear these stories of like wade robson and then i'm like thinking to myself wait hold up i know wade robson wade robson pretended to be the voice on my my album aaron's party for my brother because my brother didn't do it so wade robson did it it was like a little spoof thing an in interlude in one in my second album aaron's party and wade robson did the voice of like pretending to be my brother or some yeah. shit. And I'm like, wait, hold up. Wade leaving Neverland? What is this? Like, what do you mean leaving Neverland? Like, I left Neverland. Everything was cool, homie. <laughs> like, what's your problem? Did you dream this up? Did your parents tell you to do this? Yeah, I mean, they tried to sue for like 100 million and ultimately it was dropped. They got nothing out of it, that, as they should. Nothing, as they that should. dude didn't do shit like that. Yeah. Like, I knew Michael better than all of them. Yeah, I, I believe even, everything even Macaulay, that I've seen. If it was Macaulay yeah, I'm, right not, now, I'm not buying it. Even I'm if not, it was Macaulay Culkin sitting right here, he would tell you the same thing I did with the same assertiveness. Now, regarding James Safechuck and Wade Robson's claims in leaving Neverland, um, which they created as adults, even though they have a long-standing history since childhood of defending Michael Jackson, um, and also a history of going bankrupt just before the Leaving Neverland documentary and lawsuit. Um, I'm not going to entertain it. Uh, it has been debunked. Um, they have found that the motive was strictly for money and the court threw their case out. It's as simple as that, that leaving Neverland was a hoax. Now it gets worse. Now Hollywood gets involved because there are some things that Michael Jackson pissed some people off and, um, also the money was nice. Unfortunately, LaToya Jackson was in a very, very unfortunate um, relationship with her manager. She was, it was her husband and her manager, and he was incredibly abusive. He was disgustingly abusive. He would beat her, choke her with, with bed sheets, um, tell her what she needs to say, or she, that he's threatened to kill her entire family um, if he, if she doesn't do exactly what he wants. She was completely... Let me paint a scene for you here. This is something LaToya said. Is that one day she was in a hotel room and she wasn't even allowed to make a phone call without her manager dialing the number and overhearing the conversation that she was having. And she wasn't allowed to, to tell anyone that she was being basically held hostage. She said that she was being held hostage by her own husband and manager. This vile human being then forced LaToya because they thought, well, this is going to give us a lot of money. They're going to give us so much money for us to come onto these interviews and say that Michael Jackson is guilty. So LaToya had no choice but to show up and say Michael Jackson was guilty. And here's the evidence of that. This went on for many, many, many years. And he literally said, I'm going to kill you, your brother, everybody. Yes. No, not everybody. Just, oh. just myself. And Michael. Michael and Jan. This is not some excuse which has been dreamed up 
subsequently, this was known and reported at the time. He grabbed a bedspread, he put it over her head, started to strangle her with it. The same time, he grabbed her arm and started to twist it so badly. And so all of a sudden, Latoya, who had previously been speaking out in favor of Michael, suddenly U-turned and started selling interviews claiming that uh, her brother, in fact, was guilty early 94 when Latoya appeared on an Australian TV show and the host of the show realized that there was something wrong with the situation. He realized that all of the answers that Latoya was giving were being fed to her by somebody else uh, who he identified on the show as her husband, Jack Gordon. Jack Gordon is the, is the vile monster we speak of. Um, Latoya Jackson actually writes about this in her book, this experience, and she and both Michael have said, um, that this confused Michael. It broke his heart when he saw Latoya saying that Michael Jackson was guilty in an interview. Um, it was a few, a, a few bit later. I don't want to, I don't want to put a date on it because I don't remember the date, but I do remember, um, and it's in the book and I I think Michael Jackson also talks about this in an interview, that LaToya called him up one day, and this was after she got free from her abusive relationship, and she said, Michael, I'm so sorry. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I'm so sorry. It wasn't me. And Michael just said, I know it wasn't you. I realized it was not you. And they forgave each other that night, and then LaToya started defending Michael Jackson after that again. Jack Gordon forced you to say that your brother was a pedophile. Did you think he was? No, I did not. The courts have proven that too as well. Just to make things very clear, you recanted your accusation. Are you sure today that your brother never had any undue relationship with a child? Barbara, Michael is not. He is not. He is not a pedophile. No, he's not. So the timeline is Latoya came out and defended him. She was blackmailed by her manager slash husband to claim that he was guilty. She apologized and then went back to defending him after they split. So imagine all of these tabloids are, again, shall I point out? Remember the evidence of the reporter saying at that time, yes, whatever we could write, we just wrote it. It didn't matter if it was true. We have all these tabloids with all these made up details of like, here's the evidence of this. And here's what we, what they found at Neverland, all this crazy lies. And then you've got people getting paid off to lie about the the experience and join Chandler's allegations to make it sound more legitimate. And then you've got celebrities, his own sister, being forced, blackmailed for money to lie about Michael Jackson. This extortion plan is bigger than we could ever imagine. I would also like to point out that Radar Online was a huge reason why the rumors were re-sparked in about 2014, if I recall correctly. They came out with an extremely defamatory and wholly untrue article about the case saying that they suddenly found brand new evidence that Michael Jackson had uh, pornography and all this other strange evidence that was never released to the public. Um, a lot of the fo- the fake photographs that they actually made themselves were of things that weren't even published while Michael Jackson was alive. And one of the artists of uh, one of the photographs that was taken said, hey, that's my art, and I definitely didn't create that when Michael was alive. Um, Michael Jackson's family ended up suing Radar Online for $100 million over misreporting Michael Jackson's uh, case. And the LAPD came forward and said, no, that is not true. We did not find any evidence and still have not. So let's let's go on about the story here. Oh, let's talk about Victor Gutierrez. Now I'm getting fired up. I, I try to keep it in neutral tone. We started off that way. I'm starting to get fired up because like this is just one of the most cruel things I've ever seen. Let's talk about Victor Gutierrez. So he was part of NAMBLA, which by the way is a pedophile acceptance group. And he was the one that wrote the book, uh, Michael Jackson Was My Lover, which was a fan fiction book about Jordan Chandler and Michael Jackson, essentially. 
It was fan fiction. Mind you, he was known for being in Nambla. He was also the ghostwriter of All That Glitters, which was a book that um, the Chandlers created. And there is a lot word for word between the uh, Michael Jackson Was My Lover and All That Glitters. Word for word. And I'm going to go ahead and recite the pages where they're literally the same. MJ taps Evan on the shoulder and gives him a watch. In uh, the first book, it was on page 29. And wait, what, what is it? Uh, okay, so let me, let, me, let me word this better. I'm going to say RC and VG. VG is Michael Jackson Was My Lover's book, Victor Gutierrez, Gutierrez's original book. RC is going to be Chandler's book, okay? So page 29 for RC, page 62 for VG. The quote, my, uh, MJ buys Jordan a computer. You can find that both in RC's p- page 31 and VG's page 48. Evan confronts MJ, MJ giggles. Word for word in RC's page 30 and VG's page 63. Evan is invited to the hideout on the phone. MJ tells him not to tell June. That's in the fan fiction uh, page 62, RC page 25. MJ describes the nature of his relationship with Jordan as cosmic. RC page 30, VG page 64. June accuses Evan of not fulfilling a page or a payment of $5,000 to Jordan for the movie Robin Hood. RC page 55, VG page 83. June talks to Evan about the $7,000 first class tickets MJ purchased. RC page 21, VG page 49. On April 8th, Chandler's uh, meet German royalty at the Neverland Ranch. RC page 17, VG page 39 and 40. Evan asks his patient and, and actress Carrie Fisher about MJ. She asks her friend Arnie Klein who helped rest Evan's concerns. RC page 19 to 20, VG page 41 to 42. During some time, Evan thought that MJ was asexual or due to the Oprah interview waiting for the right one. RC page 21, Footnote 9, VG page 49. Evan initially injects MJ with 30 milligrams of Toradol, then later administers the remaining half. RC page 47, VG page 73. On some calls between Jordan and MJ, Jordan would take the phone to his room, something he previously hadn't done. RC page 15, VG page 17. June calls Evan from the ranch, telling him that MJ has too much control over Jordan and he must do something or he'll lose his son. RC page 1516, VG page 40. Process that. Obviously, it's clear as day that Victor Gutierrez was the ghostwriter for Evan Chandler's book and he just used a bunch of his fan fiction in that in that uh, accusation detailed book that everyone seems to love to quote, not realizing that a real pedophile wrote that book. This book was proven to be uh, false, by the way. The court ordered Gutierrez to pay Jackson $2.7 million in damages. He fled the country as a response. Anyway. Now, Michael Jackson uh, was pressured during this investigation to settle, to just pay the dad the money and call it a day because he had albums to produce. He had a tour to go on. He did not have time to deal with the court case, which could take a long time. So, um, if I'm mistaken, if I'm, or correct me if I'm mistaken, but I believe it was Sony who actually pressured Michael Jackson to settle. Um, so Michael Jackson ended up paying the Chandlers the money that they were seeking. Um, mind you, I want to remind you that a settlement, a civil, uh, a settlement doesn't void a criminal case. It can only void a civil case. So Michael Jackson had a civil and a criminal case. The settlement was for the civil case. He still had a criminal case, which he was found innocent for. That's the paperwork that you see on there that says, uh, close the case. There's no evidence. That's the criminal case. Two different things. You cannot pay your way out of a civil case or uh, sorry, a criminal case, only a civil one. And he had both going on. So I just wanted to highlight that detail there because people tend to be like, oh, he bought his innocence. Like you can't do that. You can't do that. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yeah, he paid off, he paid off the money and obviously it made him look bad and the, you know, the, the family got what they wanted 
And this was the biggest mistake. And, and Michael knew it at the time. He knew not to do it, but the pressure was real. And so he did. And that opened up a floodgate for more people with, with the thirst for money to open allegations. So in 1995, literally a year later, there was a new allegation that was quickly debunked. Um, and here is the evidence of that. Michael Jackson told me in no uncertain terms that settling that case in 1994 was the biggest mistake he'd ever made. He should never have settled it. He should have fought it through a trial. He would have won. It was an absurd case. But he was advised, he told me, by lawyers, by business advisors, to settle it and get rid of it. Uh, Daryl Campbell, which is the Toronto Police Department, uh, and he says, like, I, I, you know, the kid's story was very believable, too. Um, and let me, whoo, wait until I tell you who coached this kid to say what he did. Wait, you're going to flip. But hold on now. Let's hear it. I found it fairly believable, too. During police interviews, the child broke down and confirmed that he had been coached about Neverland, about Havenhurst, about Disneyland, about Michael Jackson's body. Where did he get all that information? He got it from me. This kid is a A1, number one liar. Professional. Ronnie Allen is currently serving a life sentence in a Canadian prison for pedophilia. So the person who coached the kid that came out in 1995 was a pedophile. Rodney Allen... Let, let's inmate ID. Do you guys want his inmate ID? A A eight five one three A. I doubt he's still alive, but that's his inmate ID. Um, date of birth nine seventeen nineteen fifty six. Convicted of assault at that time, in search of friends, whatever that means. Um, and that was uh, a video. This was a a secret video taped of him. And Rodney says he got it from me. So he admits it on tape, right here, on tape. He admits it. I'll play it again. About Havenhurst, about Disneyland, about Michael Jackson's body. Where did he get all that information? He got it from me. This kid is a A1, number one liar. Professional. Professional. Ronnie Allen is currently serving a life sentence. So there's another proof of, of lies. Oh, I should probably remind you, I think it was around this time, uh, Evan Chandler, you know, still trying to reap benefits. He tried to come out with an MJ hate album, like a, like music of like hating Michael Jackson, essentially. And he wanted to call it, he wanted to call it Evan's story. He's making it a lot about himself, which is kind of bizarre. So now we have the next set of allegations and I'm just going to go ahead and play this here because, um... This is, uh, I think this is Gavin. Is this Gavin? I think it's Gavin. Is it Gavin? Yeah, it is Gavin. I'm just going to go ahead and play the original source so you can get the story from someone who was there and involved. Gavin came to Michael and said, Michael, can we sleep in your room tonight? And Michael, Michael looked at me and says, I don't know. You know, I think you better ask your mother. Oh, we already asked our mother. She says, sure, no problem. I'm like, no, this is some, something's odd. This is not right. And then as I was about to go tell Gavin that he cannot sleep in Michael's room, Michael says, okay, I have a solution for this. You have to sleep in the room with me. The two children slept on the bed and Michael and I slept on the floor. The uh, felony complaint involves nine counts. Um, Seven counts of 288A in violation of uh, California Penal Code, commonly known as child molestation. Thursday, jurors listened as the teen contradicted his brother and sister's testimony and couldn't recall key details of the molestation allegations. The defense pointed out that in an early police interview, the young accuser said his grandmother had told him about a certain type of sexual act, even though he had testified that Jackson had told him about it. This young man, in a moment of, uh, of high emotion with this former dean, looks the dean in the eye and says, no, Michael Jackson didn't molest me. This was a witness that was a part of that trial. 
I was on the witness list for the trial in 2005 because I spent the entire day with Gavin Arviso at Neverland on February 19th, 2003. This was the very same day that Gavin and his mother, Janet, accused Michael of inappropriate behavior. The day that they accused Michael of wrongdoing was the day that Gavin didn't even see Michael. Was there. Instead, he was with us having fun. He wasn't even there. He, was any, he wasn't even on property. So you can see Gavin here already admits during this trial that it was not true after having a very inconsistent story. Um, mind you, I would really like to highlight that we should not be blaming the kids at all during any of this. This really falls on the parents. The kids are victims, not by Michael Jackson, but of parental abuse. This is abuse. This is probably very traumatizing for them, too, to have to go in front of a bunch of adults and lie after holding their hand up on an oath that they're promising to tell the truth. That is absolutely terrifying, and we should not uh, target the kids or feel any angst towards the kids when they are victims of adults. Just It just happens not to be Michael Jackson. Um, I would like to highlight also that Michael Jackson's bedroom... Um, I think this is where Michael Jackson said some things that didn't really sound that great in context, um, where he says like, yeah, they were allowed to sleep on my bed in my room. So Michael Jackson's room, if you've ever been to Neverland, which I know you haven't, but stick with me here and try to envision it. So Neverland, first of all, was a huge, huge house. Like it was a ranch and the house itself was like the size of a museum massive. There's a lot of rooms. Um, if you look in the, I don't even think there's pictures of it, but basically his bedroom is an apartment itself. Um, it was just so happens like, yes, they slept in his room, but his room was a house essentially. So it wasn't very intimate and Michael Jackson would not sleep on the bed with them, but rather on the floor next to them. And Macaulay Culkin does say this as well as, um, Corey Feldman says this, um, and even at the time, uh, Wade, Cha Wade says this, so, <clears throat> and I also have evidence regarding his bedroom right here. This is Macaulay Culkin, which is like the kid that was allowed at Neverland the most. Like he was always there and he has defended Michael Jackson and to this day still defends Michael Jackson. Um, I imagine he's made enough of his own money not to need Michael's no shade, but all the shade as well as the clip that's going to follow right after that is of one of the girls who was at Neverland as well, often invited, who also, you know, explains this. That, you know, they go, oh, you slept in the same bedroom as him. It's like, I don't think you understand. Michael Jackson's bedroom is two stories. <laughs> and it has like, like three bathrooms and this and that. So when I slept in his bedroom, yeah, but you have to understand the whole scenario. And the thing is with Michael is that he's not very good at explaining himself. And he never really has been. Michael Jackson, his bedroom was two stories. So when you first walked in, I didn't realize at first it was his bedroom because it didn't, his bed wasn't there on the bottom floor. But it was just, it was kind of very cluttered with a lot of things. I, I like actually sat on his bed and he was just kind of talking about Neverland to us. And that was surreal. Um, anyways, um, he also had other rooms as well. He had uh, rooms that were designated for the kids originally. Uh, to stay in their own quarters, but they would often beg to be with Michael Jackson because they didn't want to sleep alone. So I personally believe Michael should have held that boundary tighter. Um, but I can see how, especially with the parents being on the property too, I can see how he felt more safe than he should have that like, oh, the parents are here. Like they can see everything. It, you know, all is well. Unfortunately, he didn't realize that the parents were going to be the ones accusing him of things, not the kids. So it's just a lot of, if, if he had the hindsight, he might have been able to make a better decision, and he did not. I also just want to kind of close on the allegation portion of this. I want to uh, mention that uh, Jordan Chandler was a fan of Michael Jackson in his adulthood, uh, is a fan of Michael Jackson is in his adulthood. There was a college student that he was friends with at his college who they met because she was wearing a vintage Michael Jackson shirt, and he used that as a subject card to talk to her, um, and she was invited to a lot of his like personal parties, and he would often play Michael Jackson music 
as well as dance like Michael Jackson for the crowd and wore the fedora and everything. Um, and that full story explanation, it's a long one, so I'm not going to include it here, but it is in the square one documentary. She talks about it herself. Um, I also want to mention that Jordan Chandler's father did commit suicide shortly after Jordan, um, spoke out and said that he was told to lie. So Jordan did come out. There is no evidence of what he said, um, because this was a, you know, early internet and a lot of that was scrubbed. Um, but I do have evidence of, uh, his mother, uh, Michael Jackson's mom recounting, uh, reaccounting that story. And, uh, apparently, um, Evan Chandler committed suicide basically from the general embarrassment and as well as grief and guilt. So I'm going to play that. And, uh, Chandler, Evan Chandler, to say, he lied. He wanted money from Michael. And Michael had mentioned that to me. And he said, uh, he was going to do something to him. Because he, he wanted money, I think it was he was making a movie or something like that. So there's more evidence there? Um, I believe that's what it was. But it was a big lie. And his son, Jordan, who, and Michael would go to their home. He was a friend of all of them. And this man did this to him. But Jordan Chandler knew, his son knew that it wasn't true. So he came to Michael and told him, Michael, I'm sorry what's going on. I know it's not true. So Michael told him, so why don't you go and get on in the news and tell him so people wouldn't think this terrible thing about me. But he said, I can't do that. If I did that, my father would kill me. So um, since, um, <clears throat> and when we did, when the second accusation came out on Michael, and I think it was 04 or 03, one or the other, and the trial was in 05. Um, Jordan wanted to um, to be um, a witness on Michael's side, but then a lawyer had told him that if you do that, the insurance company that paid you the money will, will make you all pay it all back. Yeah. I didn't feel that George should have been able to pay it back because he was only a child. His father made him do it. But um, since Michael's been dead, Jordan came. There was it's been in the papers. I don't know. A lot of people didn't read it because only the small, you know how they do. And he had said that um, Michael hadn't touched him, hadn't done anything to him, and he um, just wish he could have let Michael know that he was going public with it before he died. And then I guess about a month or two later, his father committed suicide. And I always felt it was his father's guilt that he was lived as a rich man after telling a lie on my son and they're taking all his endorsements away from it. They took everything Michael had away from him this lie this man told. And um, I thought maybe that's, he was, a, he was ashamed to live any longer. I don't know what it was, but I think it was linked to his son coming out finally in telling the truth but the thing about it the news never mentioned it that much maybe mm -hmm. once it was a local maybe, paper and if you heard it it was probably late at night and these people have been living with this lie this man told all the time and i think the public should have known that it was a lie in 1993 when you first heard so yeah um, there's also a journalist and I forgot her name and I, I hate that I don't have that interview, but I'm sure any, any Michael Jackson fans, you might know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there was a journalist that came out, uh, she wanted to actually uncover the truth because, you know, the verdicts were coming up, Michael being clean, like, you know, there's, there's nothing to, uh, to make Michael Jackson look like a criminal. So she wanted to take all of the verdicts and all of the inconsistencies and she wanted to create a uh, pro Michael Jackson article and she wanted it to be like a correction piece and her company literally said you will be fired if you make any pro Jackson content because the anti Jackson content is making them millions and if we keep if we sit there and say that Michael Jackson was innocent that's the end of the story it will never be able to print another anti Michael Jackson article again and it's making us so much money so she was actually forbidden by the company 
to produce any pro Michael Jackson articles revealing the truth. Um, and she literally talks about this in an interview and I hate that I don't have that one. Um, if I find it, I'll probably link it down below or somebody will link it down below. Um, it's a minute detail, but it's a detail nonetheless, um, to give you an even bigger context of, of the way everyone saw this case and how it all leads back to the word money. Literally, it all happened because of money from beginning to end and through and through. So I think I covered all the main bases. I really hope I did. Um, with the allegations, Michael Jackson was not never found guilty. In fact, Michael Jackson was innocent. Um, and now you can see how this came about. Um, and it's really, really unfortunate that it did happen to someone who was known for being so kind and generous. Um, now there are a few other straggly allegations. Let's like speed around through them. Um, skin bleaching. So Michael Jackson had a skin condition called vitiligo. Vitiligo is completely, um, not, it's not controlled. It's an autoimmune disease. Um, and it's where the pigment in your skin starts to go. So the melanin just is no longer being produced and you start getting these whiter splotches all through your body like spots. Um, Michael Jackson at the time when he started developing this, which was, I believe in the eighties or late eighties is, um, he, he decided to cope with it. He would put on a bunch of makeup, a lot of theater body makeup. If you look at a lot of his, um, clothing artifacts, you'll find body makeup is all over the rims of his clothing, his pants, his socks, his gloves. It's because he put it all over his body to even out his skin tone. So he wasn't made fun of instead of embracing it. He covered it because he was often being made fun of for his looks. Ever since he was a child, they would make articles talking about his fat nose as well as his, um, acne. And also, you know, he, there is no skin bleach in the world that can make you from black to white. It does not exist. It still doesn't exist to this day. It certainly didn't back then. So it was due to his skin condition and he used makeup for the entire, in the, the entirety of his life to look like he was all one color, but he was always spotted. Um, he did use some skin lightening treatments that were uh, given to vitiligo patients to balance and kind of even out the, the differences in shades, but it still wasn't enough to make him one consistent color, nor was it enough to make him like as white as he was. He just had a very aggressive case of vitiligo. Um, but if you ever saw him without makeup, he was various shades of, um, a tanner color, some spots were still, you know, a more brownish, like a darker tan, and some spots were pure white. Um, <clears throat> and he would often wear blush, lip tint, and eye makeup detailing because when you would put a thick theater makeup all over your, I mean, give it a go, put a thick layer of foundation over your face. Your eyes just look really creepy. Like all the definition in your face disappear. You no longer have natural colors on your face, like, like the blushy colors on your cheeks. So he would wear blush and lip tints to try to make the color, you know, come back essentially. And he didn't look so washed out, especially in the media and on stage. So he wasn't wearing makeup because he wanted to be a woman. He was wearing makeup because he had a skin condition and he was trying to look normal, to look human, um, because the theater makeup was making him look completely washed out. He had no desire to transition or be a woman, nor was he gay. In fact, should I say this? Michael, don't kill me. Um, <laughs> Michael definitely had interest in women. This is from Tatiana Thompson. She told me, uh, she's the girl that was in the music video, The Way You Make Me Feel. She got fired for kissing Michael Jackson on stage. So that's the girl. I, she lives over here in Florida. We've hung out plenty of times and I've got to hear so many awesome stories about Michael Jackson. Um, and she said that he was definitely very respectful, very chivalrous, but he had a wandering eye and he liked women with big knockers <laughs> um, and would ca often call women fish. So if you see videos, like home videos of Michael Jackson, he goes, oh, look at them fish. He's talking about women with big tits. Fish. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Get your way. Get your way. Get your way. 
the Michael Jackson death. This one, I'm going to speed around it just because this could honestly be another two hour podcast. Um, but the Jackson family has out, has said multiple times, especially Latoya, Janet Jackson has said it, um, that Michael Jackson was murdered. Uh, Michael Jackson called Latoya a few nights before he was murdered saying like, you know, Latoya, they're going to kill me. They're gonna, I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to kill me. I know it. They're planning it. And then days later, his fear came true. He was allegedly murdered by Conrad Murray with the ne- medical leg- negligence. Um, Michael Jackson did upset people in the industry. Uh, he was making some choices that uh, benefited him, but didn't benefit the, the opposer. Um, he was buying catalogs that had high interest and he was just upsetting people. So, um, unfortunately that ended with, uh, him passing away. Uh, if you guys want me to expand on his death and the evidence behind that, I could do that on a different episode. I feel like my camera is about to die too. So I really should put that for another episode, maybe a part two, but, um, I, I believe that Michael Jackson was murdered and his family believes it and, there's enough evidence to really, to really back that up, um, strongly. Um, I don't think enough to back it up in, in the eye of the law, but at least if anybody has two brain cells to rub together, you can kind of see that it doesn't really look like an accident. So I think that really covers all of them. I really hope I didn't miss it, uh, miss any big details. Um, I think that was all of it. So if, if I happen to remember any other things I should correct, regarding Michael Jackson's legacy. I can maybe make a part two if I ever decide to expand on his death conspiracy or I can put them in the comment section below, you know, as bullet points in case. But essentially, this should give you a really good understanding of how misunderstood Michael Jackson was. I personally call him the real life Frankenstein um, because like the original Frankenstein's monster, he was um, accused of being a monster even though he really wasn't trying to harm anyone and it's really um alarming how the media can completely control public perception with just about anyone and anything and it makes you wonder what celebrities today are are victims of the same crime are are victims of the media lying about them i can name a few um not to michael jackson's degree i think michael jackson's degree was just out of control Um, unfortunately he was the most rich and powerful man of his time at the time. And when you have that much power and that much money behind you, you do have a big fat target on your back. Uh, and, and, and it was a very unfortunate the way it played out. So, um, hopefully this podcast was educational and, and it opened your eyes to not be so easily fooled by what the media may produce and to not believe every lie. And to kind of look, keep looking over your shoulder because not everyone is going to be your friend and mean it. So um, I hope you learned from Michael Jackson's story. You take away some life lessons. And uh, I hope that you guys continue pushing to clear Michael Jackson's name. Um, I think it's very important too, uh, considering that he was such a huge humanitarian and, and has helped society so much as he has. I think we owe it to him to kind of correct the wrongs that were done to him. Um, If he wasn't so charitable, maybe I wouldn't feel as strongly, but just knowing what he's done for the world, we owe that to him. So that's why I made this. I don't gain anything from this podcast episode. In fact, I probably lose sponsorships just for the title alone. So if you want to support me, make sure you subscribe and share this video. Um... And I'll see you guys in the next episode.